All right, so we can get started with the intro and then um, more people can come. That's that's totally fine. So welcome everyone to Real Engineering Stories presented by the Conestoga Engineering Society uh, in partnership with National Engineering Month. And we are really excited to share our perspective on engineering as students and stories from our co-ops and any other information that hopefully will help you along your, your path as you navigate these exciting times of choosing your career in the coming couple of years. So um, before we get into our presentation, we have some opening remarks from Bruce Matthews. So I'd like to send it over to him to welcome everybody. Super, thanks very much, Brittany. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Bruce Matthews and I'm the executive director at the Association of Consulting Engineering Companies, Ontario. I've been a professional engineer for 31 years and on behalf of ACEC Ontario, I'm pleased to provide some perspective for this National Engineering Month session, Real World Engineering Stories. Engineers are problem solvers. They plan, facilitate, and drive change to create a better world. Creating positive change in anything requires effort, but effort alone really isn't enough. The second law of thermodynamics, which you'll learn about during your engineering studies, tells us that change is inevitable but without input and controls, that change tends toward disorder and chaos. And this is true for physical systems as well as socioeconomic systems. Solving the social, environmental, and economic challenges of today requires innovation driven by design and understanding the underlying science. Engineering exists at the intersection of scientific principles and design principles. Consulting engineers and the firms they work for are centers of excellence for a broad range of today's challenges. Consulting engineers have designed and built much of our public infrastructure, things like transit systems, roads and bridges, water and wastewater systems, and hospitals. They also support private clients in areas like land development, mining, engineering, aerospace, and forensic. Every year, ACEC Ontario recognizes and celebrates the best work of our member firms at the Ontario Engineering Project Awards. This year's ceremony will be presented via video on the 20th of May, and I encourage you to tune in and learn about the top tier of real-world engineering projects. More information is available at our website, acecontario.ca. Thank you very much, and with that, I'll turn it back to Brittany. Awesome. Thank you, Bruce. So getting into the rest of our presentation, um, just want to quickly introduce all the four of us who will be presenting uh, on behalf of the Conestoga Engineering Society. So I won't go too in depth. Uh, you'll get to chat with us throughout this presentation, um, but it's me and Brent and Mitch, Jeff. And so we've got four mechanical engineering students and one electronics engineering student. Thanks for representing the electronics uh, students, Jeff. Uh, so, Moving on to the agenda, we're first gonna go over what is engineering and then we're gonna talk about engineering student life and then share our stories from our co-ops and different school projects that we've been involved in. And then we're gonna go into finding your path in STEM and then end with some prizes and a Q&A period. So first of all, what is engineering? So engineering uses math and physics to predict the behavior of systems. System is just a group of components that function together in a greater system to achieve some common task. Um, so, you know, it can be anything, it's really broad. Um, it can be anything from like an integrated and really in-depth different uh, manufacturing line to something like, you know, a grip strength trainer I have just have laying around, kind of hard to see, but you now you've got like eight different springs and they all have to come together to give you some strong forearm strength. So um, solving new and old problems. So new problems like, we face in our in our newer decades, um, more recent decades of you know climate change and having to tackle new solutions to that, and then old problems. So like cars have been around for many decades, and they uh, are always we're always looking for new ways to transform that industry and several uh, things like that. So it can be broader specific. Um, even there's so many different streams of engineering. And even if you like choose one stream like mechanical, then there's so many different uh, things you can do with that or so you can tackle it as a generalist or um, you know stick to one thing that you're really passionate about. 
and it can also be viewed as applied physics. So turn it over to Brent to talk about that. Yeah, so the question here is what does applied really mean? Um, so engineering is applied scientists. Scientists make theories and we tend to apply them to real world, world problems. So like E equals MC squared is the famous equation uh, versus building a nuclear power plant. E equals MC squared is the theory, but the power plant would be the application of that theory. Um, Conestoga and other polytechniques uh, offer some hands-on learning and applied research. So if you think about lots of labs and building automation equipment, um, which is kind of specific to the applied nature of the course. And pretty much if there's a discipline that exists in science, it likely exists as an engineering. So beyond mechanical, which is what three of us do and electrical, there could be there's software, biomed, ge uh, geology and civil. Um, possibilities are really endless uh, for engineering. So before we get into some of the managing your coursework and labs of engineering, we just talk about some of the fun stuff behind engineering too. So that includes engineering student life and extracurriculars. Um, so academic settings generally can sometimes be quite binding and restrictive for um, students that learn best through doing and working with their hands. And some opportunities like joining design teams um, allow students to learn at their own pace in a hands-on setting. Um, and it's in a team of students ran by students that allows you to make friends doing it and generally grow as a person. Um, at Conestoga specifically, uh, we have three design teams. We have a team called Mini Baja. So they design, build, prototype, uh, an all weathered rugged off-road recreational vehicle and then race it. So it's basically like a mini off, a mini side-by-side, -side, but with one, uh, with one, uh, one rider. Uh, and there's also Conestoga Formula Electric, which I'm a part of. Uh, it's a racing team dedicated to designing, engineering, and eventually racing a fully electric formula vehicle. Uh, not the same size as the ones you see on TV, but they're a little bit smaller, but they go just as quick and they're just as scary <laughs> to ride in. Uh, and there's also Concrete Toboggan, a racing team. So they engineer uh, a toboggan that has concrete runners and some form of enclosed steel uh, structure. And the students that are crazy enough to get involved with that, they race them down a giant ski hill and the first one is to get to the bottom win. But you get to develop your own substructures, you get to develop your own concrete um, all by yourself. And, and it's all self-taught. The three teams that are at Conestoga, we share a garage space on campus and we have access to a machine shop, a welding lab. Uh, we even have some of our own tools and equipment in the shop that you can see in the top right corner. Um, and we take ourselves seriously, all design teams do. Uh, we're competitive. Uh, some of us are very competitive, but we also really have a lot of fun with it. And that's the whole point of joining a design team. Um, Apart from the uh, academic setting, we also have uh, an engineering society, which is more professional and social, uh, which I got involved with in my second year. So the Conestoga Engineering Society is, we exist to provide support for and advocate on behalf of engineering students at Conestoga. Uh, before COVID, unfortunately, um, we ran inter-school events uh, with students from University of Waterloo, University of Guelph, really anywhere that's local to us, um, and some that aren't. Uh, we ran our own weekend long engineering competitions. We had speakers give talks to our students. Uh, just two weeks ago, I think we had a speaker from the Planetary Society. So I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Bill Nye. Unfortunately, he couldn't show up, but we heard a lot about Bill Nye and about how that society works. So it's pretty cool. Um, what else do we do? Uh, we have, we, we even send students to like weekend long conferences across Canada, which we'll hear more about in the next slide. Um, but we run social events like poker nights. We have wing nights with our professors. We do movie nights, 90s gaming nights, and of course we give free food away as, uh, whenever possible. Just a couple few days ago, we had, I think it was Pi Day, it's on the 14th. Um, we usually have like six or seven pies that go within the first few minutes of students coming to classes. So we give food out at every, every corner of the school. Um, so one of the main ideas of running an engineering society is to allow for students to not only grow um, into a future engineer, but also grow as a person. And I firmly believe that one shouldn't really go without the other. Um, so I've been involved in society for two years, like I said, uh, this year running society as its president. So uh, getting involved with an engineering society, if you decide to go to, or if you decide to go an engineering uh, degree route, it's one of the best things you can do to improve your own pe your people skills, uh, to get a better understanding of what the engineering profession is, is really like. Um, and it's also one of the best ways to make lifelong friends and generate like a network of students and professionals while you're in school, which will help you upon your graduation. You also get to meet some pretty cool characters. Um, uh, last year, we got to meet Santa, which was really cool. 
Uh, he was very excited to meet us just as we were with him. Um, uh, next up, I'm just gonna go to the next slide there. We have a quick video to show you about uh, one of my favorite conferences, which is the Conference on Sustainability and Engineering. Uh, it's called CSC. So all, there's like eight of these conferences that we send students to each year. This is just one of them. Um, so they usually ran over a weekend and most the most important part of them is they're fully loaded with industry professionals that come give talks. So there's um, uh, employees from Tesla. Uh, just this year, we actually had David Suzuki come out to give a talk and Jeff was there. So um, I don't know how he felt about that, but I would have been super excited to hear that. Um, last year it was held in Waterloo. So we, we took the Ion Rail train like you can see there, um, cut down on emissions for the weekend. Uh, meals are all made for you, especially lunch and dinner, which is always a nice treat, um, especially for me because I was living off KD in my first year, so it was great. Uh, we had round tables with students from across Canada, discuss issues that are being tackled by engineers currently and are also um, looking forward to problems that the profession and um, we as students may face in the future. Um, it's also a half day case study, which you can see right here, where um, everyone groups up into big groups and you solve a problem. Last year it was uh, wastewater. Um, related, I can't remember the exact case study. But anyways, you present it to a panel of professionals and they give you insight as to how to carry forward if you do wanna carry forward with that case study, which is cool. Uh, night events, you go to museums like you just saw, you do sustainable events, um, you karaoke. Uh, generally, you just wanna get a good idea of what the local culture is. So sometimes we're in the East Coast, sometimes we're over on the West Coast in BC, but this year it was in Waterloo. So we had a tour of Waterloo culture, which is basically just a lot of pub tours and some really good food. Um, and generally, you're, just, it, it, you're, you're, you're there to create that network of students and professionals, like I said before. This is one of the best opportunities to do it. So I'll just let you look at it for the next few seconds, but we can cut the video. Um, that's about it, Jeff. I think that's, that's good. We can continue on. Sorry, I'm trying to get back to the slideshow, technical difficulty, sorry. No, I don't want to subscribe. You should just be able to click off, like click out of the, uh, yeah. Sorry, one sec. If you're, if you're in PowerPoint, just, uh, are you in PowerPoint or are you online? Yeah, I'm in PowerPoint, but this is taking up my whole screen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. Just use that. Uh, yeah, sorry. Just one, the, yeah. one sec, one sec. All right. We'll just do it's this. Time to say if anyone at the end has any questions about uh, the conferences in specific, I'd love to field them. So definitely think about them if you have any. Yeah, we will have a Q&A period at the end, um, so you can definitely hang on to your questions until then. Um, uh, this is hilarious. I'm so sorry. I can uh, launch mine. Yeah, the problem is that it's not letting me leave this sl slide. And it won't let me present from the next slide. All right, looks like Brent's got her. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry, guys. <laughs> oh, We're not wow. software engineers, so it's fine. What a moment. Yeah, you think someone in a technology engineering program would be able to figure out PowerPoint, but here we are. Anyways, um, yeah, so I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about managing workload in engineering. Uh, so there's always a reputation in engineering that students are always doing work and, you know, we're spending all night in our labs, everything like that. And uh, it can be true. I think uh, all four of us here that our students uh, have definitely put in our share of late nights in labs, uh, finishing up projects. Uh, but I always find that if you spend your time, you manage your time well, you free up a lot of time and you're not spending you know, countless all-nighters doing homework and making sure you get assignments in before deadlines. I think a like a really important thing is that if you want to do something, you'll find a way. And if you don't, you'll find an excuse. Uh, so I can tell you that this is extremely accurate. There are always going to be courses in engineering that you like over other courses. And you're going to find that those courses, the homework and the assignments are always a little bit easier to do, but the other courses are just important to complete. 
And um, part of being an en engineering student for these courses, it's really just but about putting in the work uh, so you can set yourself up for success down the road. Uh, I will tell you that most employers probably, uh, most employers won't really care if you get an 80% average or a 70% average, but in engineering courses, 60% is the passing grade for most of our courses. No one really wants to graduate from an engineering program and tell people, yeah, I'm an engineer, but I'm only really right 60% of the time. And as a student, I can tell you, uh, I can tell you first experience, you don't want to be going into your final exams, sailing the line in between passing and failing a course, uh, because it's extremely stressful and having experience going into exams where I can have a little bit less stress and my grades are a bit higher. Uh, it's always easier and studying for the exams is a little bit less stressful and obviously a better situation whenever you're a student. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Brent. Yeah. Uh, so we just have examples of some timetables that we have throughout the program. So on the uh, left-hand side, you'll see as an example, a uh, timetable from first year, I think mechanical uh, from the M MSc program. Yeah. Uh, and then on the right hand side is the fourth year timetable. It's actually my timetable from the semester. So generally you're going to get the same amount of courses throughout your degree. Every semester you'll have uh, five courses and then a project course. Uh, most of the courses, like two or three of them will be core courses and then whatever the other ones are, are uh, non-core courses. Uh, but they're all focused around engineering and just different aspects of it. I find that the best way of organizing time, best way I manage my time is uh, when I have classes that have a couple hour breaks in between, I'm not sitting around, I mean, right now I'm not sitting around playing video games uh, in between courses and stuff like that. Uh, and when I'm in lab or like when we're on campus, I'm not sitting in the cafeteria for two hours, just hanging out. I might go down to the cafeteria, eat lunch, but then after that it's, you know, I got an hour and a half now before the next class, might as well do, tinker around on some project work or, you know, maybe do a couple questions from the assignment that I have due next week. I think our program does a really good job of uh, assigning work well ahead of time. So you're not getting an assignment that's due in three days. Uh, you're getting an assignment that's due maybe in two weeks. And then it's your obligation to organize your time to make sure you get that done within those two weeks. You're not stressed out in two weeks from two weeks after, you know, trying to get it done two hours before. Um, the teachers are always around to help. And I think kind of a big difference between high school and, and engineering programs and most post-secondary programs is that you're not gonna have teachers hounding you for assignments on deadlines. Uh, first-hand experience, uh, teachers, teachers generally will maybe give you a reminder a day before an assignment is due to make sure that you're aware like, yeah, it's gonna be closing tomorrow at midnight or tomorrow at noon or something. Uh, but if you're late on the assignment, they're not going to send you a message the next day. It's like, oh, you didn't hand in this assignment. Where's this assignment? That's on your, that's kind of on your plate. And if you don't get it done, you don't get it done. It is what it is. Um, but yeah, uh, we can move on. <laughs> so as Britt mentioned, uh, my name is Mitchell Bond. I'm a fourth year student in mechanical systems engineering. And I just made this quick video. It's not a quick video. <laughs> I made this video uh, to just give you guys an idea of what, uh, the day in the life of mechanical systems engineering student looks like. Go ahead. Okay, I'm just gonna make sure that I'm actually sharing my audio here because I don't think I was. And the enhanced video. Yeah. Ooh, that's the wrong one. Where are we here? There we go. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mitchell Bond. I'm a fourth year mechanical systems engineering student at Commissary College. And I'm here to talk to you today about what to expect from a day in a program like mine. Generally, my program focuses on mechanical, industrial, and control engineering, which allows us to walk the line between mechanical engineering and mechatronics engineering. Um, we learn how to design, manufacture, assemble robotic arms, and various other mechanical systems. And then we learn how to control, test, and implement those same systems into real world projects and we get to do that every year. So most of our semesters have six courses just like every other engineering program. Um, and in addition, a yearly project class. So that makes seven total each semester. 
So some semesters are more focused on mechanical engineering practices, like um, drawing principles. That was in our first year. That, that, that's where I learned how to use uh, SolidWorks, which is a 3D CAD software. Fourth year, which is what I'm in right now, uh, there's a robotics course as an example, and I'm learning how to control, program, and plan robotic arm pathways and its trajectories using kinematics and a little bit of calculus. So a lot of similar stuff actually from uh, grade 12 high school. But we also have some in-person labs coming up actually in the next week or two, hopefully. We're actually gonna be programming Fanuc uh, Stably and Denzel robots ourselves. Other semesters are more focused on electronics rather than mechanical. So that's where we kind of bridge into this mechatronics world. Um, so we work with electronics and we also worry about their relationship to the mechanical systems that we're building. So classes like sensors, actuators, and instruments in second year that have taught me how through a bunch of hands-on labs, how to use a variety of well-known sensors and actuators being used in industry right now and how to design control systems and implement safety practices for live wired circuits. But the best thing about taking all these courses at Conestoga um, is that I can actually look back at them and know that I grasp most of the required learning outcomes. Um, I know because I actually apply the theories with my, with my hands um, many times over year after year. So each year we're provided an eight month long project in the form of a class. Like I said, that was the class that brought us to seven total. Um, and we also have our own project room for each of those classes, mostly. Um, we go through every step of the engineering design process and implement implementation process, like we're actually creating a project for a real customer. Um, I believe, personally, that learning through lectures and textbook readings can only get you so far. Um, and I actually love to apply what I've learned in class to prove to myself that what I'm learning is actually sticking. I'm not just identifying knowledge, but actually retaining it and improving upon my, my, uh, my skill sets. In first year project, we're tasked with developing a pick and place robotic arm that would pick up different size plates from a loading zone and align them properly at the drop off zone such that the tower plates would fall over only after the last plate was placed. We design our own arms, we manufacture them. Some of them we manufacture again uh, and again after that, uh, learning and iterating from our mistakes each time we messed up. Uh, we developed a safety uh, switching circuit to control our robot with a super cool pinstripe metal box that looks like it's out of a construction site. And uh, we actually welded that together ourselves using an oxyacetylene torch in the welding lab. Uh, and this photo here, you can see, gives you a good idea of what a robotic arm looked like. Um, and then this photo is of our team on the day that we presented our finalized project. And you can kind of see in the in the left corner there that that uh, control box I was talking about. When it was time to test our system, uh, sometimes aspects of it just wouldn't work. But a normal day for me and my team included uh, setting up extra machine shop time between classes to improve or fix a part, uh, and usually some kind of R&D time or research and development time um, in the project room after our classes had finished for the day to implement those new parts or to do uh, new test wiring, new pneumatic valves, um, even just reading over manuals together, really anything that we needed to do just to fix our own issues. Uh, we worked as a team and we learned as a team, often helping each other to identify issues and brainstorm solutions together. It was so much more rewarding and efficient than reading through a textbook by yourself in your dorm room. Trust me, I've done both. Um, and I found our process to actually be very similar to how similar or to how actual engineering teams work in practice. So um, working together as a collective often brought about solutions faster and more free from error throughout my co-ops. And our first year project was the best intro I could have asked for to the co-ops that we had later in, in our program. And I'm just gonna put a video here at the end um, where we actually had our first full successful uh, full motion articulation test. Um, every move worked as it should have. We were super surprised and we were on the moon when the video ended. There were quite a few uh, busy and late nights due to first year project, but the work eventually paid off. And at the end of our first year, we had a working robotic arm that we were super proud of. It's a culmination of eight months of learning a bunch of different courses packed into one project. It worked really well, um, even perfectly once or twice. Uh, obviously, we couldn't catch that on camera. Um, and the lessons I learned from the project, I still remember today. Uh, some lessons like never accidentally leaving the spindle break on during a milling operation. Big yikes. 
uh, or that backlash of robotic joints can cause massive amounts of torque on fasteners near said joints, potentially causing them to completely shear. Uh, but it also taught me that working as a team and being able to rely on your teammates can get you miles further in a project than playing lone wolf and trying to show off. The video that's playing right now um, shows our one of our attempts to stack five plates and get them to topple over on the, the final, the fifth plate. Uh, kind of successful, we had needed a little extra assistance to get the plates to topple at the end, but nevertheless. Second year project uh, was just as busy with just as many courses happening in parallel, but with a wider range of learning outcomes. So most of the systems in second year project were automated and closer resembled what is used in robotic work cells in industry. So we were tasked with creating an automatic work cell that would identify, sort, pick, place, press, and eject plastic and metal washers. Uh, a couple dozen of them were assorted washers were just dumped somewhere into the cell. And it was our job to design, machine, assemble, and automate and control the intermediate steps to get that washer from point A to point B. So we programmed the automated components of the process and designed and tested DC, AC, and pneumatic power systems, which moved our assemblies, our second year project, uh, it offered so many different learning experiences that I kind of had to choose which aspects I was most interested in. Uh, and I chose to focus on designing our main robotic arm, which had to translate one way rotational motion of the AC motor into reciprocating 90 degree motion. So our robotic arm was actually useful. Um, the arm can be seen in the middle of the photo that's right there. Uh, it just rotates using a brass bushing and that center, a fixed center rotational rod. So I got to work on a ton of CAD modeling and design of mechanisms, which uh, when, working on, when working on the arm, um, I needed to see uh, how much load it could take and what kind of mechanisms would work for the motion we needed. Um, and that helped me create my profile when applying for, for sorry, my portfolio for co-ops. So all the CAD work I did, I tossed into a portfolio and I applied to co-ops with it. So most days in second year project looked a lot like those in first year project just a lot less over, a lot less time overall. So we would meet up after our classes and work through the issues we identified through testing. But since there was more software involved with project in second year, we learned how to fix bugs, decode our code or debug our code, uh, improve integration between mechanical and electrical components. Uh, as you can see in the in initial panel wiring that we had here in this picture, uh, there were quite a few issues to resolve. So. Uh, issues like the dreaded pick and place uh, mishap all nighter of April 5th, 2019, where we could not, not get one of the through beam sensors to uh, identify a present washer at the pickup location. Um, it was the true engineering marvel of a hammer that ended up saving the day, or I guess morning at that point. Um, but some problems require a lot of times to fix, or a lot of time to fix, uh, like the one I just mentioned. Um, and some were quick fixes, but each problem forced us to find our own solution. Um, this process of self-discovery and solving our own problems with the resources and tools provided in class was immeasurably valuable uh, to my learning process individually. Second year project also introduced me to industrial sized resin 3D printers, and I absolutely went berserk over it, um, as can be seen in the various models of magazines that I had 3D printed. Um, so those magazines just oriented and held the washers before they were uh, picked up by the robotic arm. Please don't do this, but alas, Conestoga was patient with my learning process, as I call it. So I found there's actually a direct correlation between the magnitude of effort that you put into project class and the magnitude of knowledge and resources that you came out of project class with. So for me, it was a chance to apply the skills that I was interested in and develop skills that I identified needing improvement before diving into real world um, the real world of engineering in my co-ops after you after you end your second year. Uh, the same notion of you get out what you put in, as I've said before, can be applied at a micro scale too. So on a daily basis, that is. Normally, the day in the life of an engineering student is rather busy, as you'll hear from almost every engineering student. Um, but you can determine alone how busy you'll actually be based on how much you want to apply yourself. So I personally will suggest to you to push yourself and to apply yourself as much as possible. Uh, you'll quickly learn your boundaries and most importantly, how to improve your boundaries. 
quicker you get to them and identify them, the quicker you can start improving them. So your engineering education is just the first step in becoming an engineer. So failing a test or even a course is not the end of the world, and it's definitely not the end of your degree. Most of us have failed or dropped a course, and I'd say all of us have definitely failed the test. Um, making that first step um, as involved as possible and creating a solid, well-rounded foundation, that's exactly what you need to do when you first come into an engineering degree. And most importantly, um, know that one day in the life of an engineer um, will not be the same as the next day for that same student. Um, every day has new problems to solve, new barriers to get over. Uh, it'll seem unmanageable at times, like that all-night sensor hammer incident that I mentioned. Um, or you might feel on top of the world at others with tons of butterflies, like when you start your first co-op. So getting involved in extracurriculars, uh, in extracurriculars like student clubs, design teams, for example, or just generally creating a better sense of community around you. Um, and it helped me get through the tougher times in my degree, and it also made the good times even better. And my suggestion to you um, is to do the same. Thank you. All right. Thanks a uh, lot. Yeah, Jeff, you're up. Uh, yeah, just a uh, just a short video on the ESE stuff. Um, I didn't have a ton of pictures or videos from projects from first second, from first and second year. Unfortunately, uh, most of our projects were design schematics and software code, so it's kind of it's kind of boring to watch on screen. But uh, hopefully, hopefully this will be all right, so we can we can roll it if you like. Hello everyone, my name is Jeff Shear, and I'm a fourth year student in the Electronic Systems Engineering Program at Conestoga College. And I'm here today to share with you a little bit of what it's like to be an ESCS student at Conestoga and what we generally do on a day-to-day -day basis. I think if I really had to sum up the work I do on it every day, it would fall into three categories, software design, hardware design, and math. And I have some examples up of what those three things look like over the four years in the ESC degree. So on the right here, I have a PCB that I designed in second year, and this PCB was connected to a microcontroller and used to control a small robot uh, virtually uh, with a controller. And I can show you an example of what this project looked like when it was finished. This is actually an example of one of my classmates, Justin. I just didn't, I haven't had a chance to take a video of my completed project, but uh, yeah. Over here in this top left box is a repository for a third year elevator project. And the con code contained in this repository is the design and implementation of a website that was used to control a physical elevator. And the elevator was controlled over the internet. Unfortunately, I can't bring it up as in a, like a working example because the elevator has been taken apart uh, since the project was completed eight months ago. Uh, but the code exists within this uh, project repository. And the last thing I have is an example of some of the complex math that we are introduced to in this program. So this is an example of an assignment uh, in my electromagnetics course this semester. And this math does look pretty complex and don't get me wrong, it is pretty complex. It also combines concepts and theories that we've been taught in the previous semesters and applies them to solving problems around electric and magnetic fields in various environments. So even though this is very complex, We've been doing the base work of these mathematics over the last four years, and really this course is piecing together a lot of the theories that we already have learned and really just applying them to real world problems. Something that I've enjoyed in this program is really just that, is our ability to learn complex theories and be taught how to apply those theories to solve real problems. I think anyone who enjoys solving problems and at least moderately enjoys math should really consider engineering as a potential career field. Some of the experiences that I have had because of my time in this program are working as an engineering support in the nuclear industry in Bruce County, working as a deployment support engineer with a company solving complex issues in the healthcare field with hospital networks all across North America, 
and working as a systems analyst for a company that offers operations as a service. I really hope that you've enjoyed our presentation today and are learning about the different fields and opportunities that exist in the engineering field. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, hey, so in uh, 2019, I did a manufacturing engineering co-op at Tesla. Um, as part of this program, co-ops are mandatory, uh, as with a lot of engineering co-ops. Uh, so this short video is just gonna show you kind of what a day in the life of an engineering co-op would be, um, as well as I think it was pretty close to what a full-time manufacturing engineer would be. Uh, at Tesla, um, I kind of had to piece together some photos because obviously I couldn't take photos within the factory on my co-op because uh, that's all proprietary information, but uh, hopefully this video gives you a good idea of what it's like. Okay, so um, in 2019, I did a co-op at Tesla, and I'm just going to walk you through what a day in the life of a manufacturing engineer co-op looks like at Tesla. So what is Tesla? Um, you've probably heard of them by now. They're kind of a, uh, an emerging electric car company that have made some ripples in the automotive industry. They make uh, a few cars. This is the Model 3. It's full electric. Um, so the place that I worked at was Gigafactory in Nevada. They made the drive units, so the electric motors and the batteries for the Model 3. Here's me on the left in front of the big T in the lobby. Uh, here's an idea of where it's located. It's just over the Nevada-California border. Uh, and this is a view of what it looks like to come into work. It's pretty beautiful. Lots of horses, uh, wild horses running around, desert climate, uh, really cool. Lots of good hiking and and very, very fun for the adventurer. So uh, I'll start off with what a, a manufacturing engineering is, because you might not know. Manufacturing engineers design the equipment that manufactures a product, and they also solve problems related to yield and efficiency. So for example, uh, if demand for electric cars has risen, how would we double the output of a factory without building a new one? That's like a, a problem that a manufacturing engineer might solve. Uh, so here's a little flow chart of where the manufacturing engineer fits in to the uh, hierarchy of other engineers, at least within Tesla. So we start off here on the left. Um, we've got a design engineer who designs a product that gets the design gets passed along to the manufacturing engineer who designs the equipment to make the product. So if you, your design engineer makes the scooter, the manufacturing engineer makes the equipment to make that scooter in mass production. Once the equipment's done, it gets passed off the equipment engineer who maintains it, and then the production engineer who kind of uh, allocates resources and makes sure everything's scheduled on time. Um, the information flows back through these people as the production engineer is going to notice when there's problems with the line, and that gets past the equipment engineer. If they can't fix it, it's going to go back to the manufacturing engineer, and they're going to say, hey, we need you to uh, improve this line or change something up about it. And uh, sometimes the manufacturing engineer, in part of your job, you might have to talk to the design, uh, the product engineer, the design engineer, to evaluate whether a product can be manufactured or not. Um, yeah, so um, here we've got a photo of uh, one of the uh, plants at Tesla. So this is the final assembly. Um, as you can see here, this is a uh, an enclosure for a drive unit. So we've got a photo here of this is a drive unit in a car. So this is the aluminum enclosure. Uh, it's going to go along this line on the pallet. It's on an automatic conveyor belt. And through the process, it's going to get a, an electric motor put in. It's going to have wiring put in. The other half is going to go on top. And it's going to get filled with oil, uh, tested, make sure everything's good. And then it's going to get taken off the line and shipped out to uh, be put in a car in California. So uh, I'm just going to, I showed this image because this is a great example of what you would one see as a manufacturing engineer. This is the environment that you're going to be spending a lot of your days in. Um, I spent a lot of time running around here, looking at things, wrenching on things, fixing things, or coming down here to measure and, and check over things when I'm making designs. So an example of what you might uh, do as in a manufacturing engineer could be, uh, you could design a cart to remove defect parts from the production line. Um, let's say an associate wants to come up and remove these uh, heavy pallets, but it's too heavy. Uh, you're gonna push a cart up and so it slides out on that. And you gotta design all the safety features to make sure it doesn't fall off when they don't want it. 
Uh, you may need to design a swinging conveyor that eliminates the need for the red stairs. So let's say they want to get a, a forklift to that machine behind the uh, conveyor now. And they need that to come in twice a day. You're going to need to design something to maybe that conveyor now swings and opens. Maybe it's like a drawbridge. Um, and you're going to evaluate those different uh, possibilities and make a solution. Uh, over here, a smaller task might be you need to research, order, and install a new sensor that senses parts with less error. So let's say that sensor every uh, one time at a 10 times, you know, nine times out of 10, it works great. But that one time it uh, says there's a part there when there isn't, and it's causing downtime and somebody to come and check it. You're going to figure out what the root cause is and install a new sensor. Another small one might be uh, this motor here is showing its age and it's making some funny noises and you think it's going to break but it's been discontinued so you've got to go to suppliers of that motor and figure out uh what's going to replace it so my daily schedule at tesla uh is pretty flexible uh, there's a lot of variation in it but approximately it would get i would get up between seven and nine and make my way into work it didn't really matter when you showed up you kind of make your own schedule and you work however many hours you're going to work that day eight or ten or if you wanted to work overtime uh, coffee and cereal is on top of the factory. That was really nice. Uh, my morning might look like I would take a short meeting with my boss or project lead. I usually do office uh, desk type work in the morning. So I would check and respond to emails, I would usually uh, quotes and orders for parts and materials. Um, and then I would design some components uh, on my computer in AutoCAD or something, schedule a meeting and scheduling a meeting with a, a project lead to look them over. I might also procure some things, prepare orders for uh, parts that I need to assemble. Uh, then I'd stop by the food trucks for lunch, get myself a pizza or a taco or something. Uh, in the afternoon, I would switch to more hands-on stuff and run around the factory. So I might, I would get an email from the, um, uh, shipping department and they would I would receive new parts or run around and try to find them install them on a new machine I was building um, I might install a new piece of tooling during scheduled downtime which is kind of fun because they've got like 60 minute windows of okay you got to install this part and if you don't install it in that time they're gonna you know, have some uh, people breathing down your neck you might have to fabricate some new sensor brackets um, if you don't want to buy them or you need them ASAP uh, or I would uh, talk to associates on the floor and see if they have any problems. This is a really important one. Um, it's actually really valuable for an engineer to have is being able to communicate with uh, the associates and because they're the ones that are doing the hands-on um, and dealing with the products every day so they know where the problems arise. I would say it's a 50-50 split uh, between hands-on and desk work, um, for me at least in this job and you make up your own schedule for the project given to you by your mentor or manager. So there's a lot of flexibility, a lot of independence. You kind of got to be a self-starter and be able to work on things uh, by yourself. So office work, uh, this is an example of the office collaboration space, pretty open concept, uh, sit stand desks. Um, this is kind of standard all across Tesla. Some of the, an idea of some of the uh, computer work you're going to do. So this is a CAD model of a robotic cell. Um, yeah, if you were designing a, a cell from scratch, you might make them from scratch and order all these components and uh, get them in together and find people to install them. Or you might take this and say, oh, I need a little tiny part on the end of arm tooling here on this robot. So I'm going to zoom in and use that as a reference, make it verify that it's uh, correct, and then do some work on it. Um, Another example would be McMaster Car. You're going to be well acquainted with this. If you're a manufacturing engineer, in a lot of cases, you're going to be using off-the-shelf components that have already been designed that could be, um, you can put a product number down, somebody can replace it in a day. Um, so you're using a lot of these. You download models from this website, build your thing, order it, uh, put it all together. Some hands-on work, for example. This guy's doing some work on an end-of-arm tooling on a robot. Um, I did a fair bit of that, uh, either checking things or installing new components, seeing how they worked. Uh, this guy over here is machining. This varies from place to place. Some, some more or less, but uh, at Tesla, I was fabricating brackets and parts for things that I needed or, or prototype machinery, which is a lot of fun. I really like that. And then down here, we've got uh, some people setting up a new piece of equipment. And this is, uh, you know, it's a stock image, but it's very uh, similar to what you'd be doing. You usually have a couple engineers, you're wrenching away on something. And uh, yeah, 
So disclaimer, uh, there's a great deal of var variability within even the same engineering fields. Um, so some jobs, even in my co-ops, I've worked some jobs that are very desk heavy, you know, 90% of the time at my desk. And I've worked jobs like Tesla that are like up to 50-50. Um, so yeah, depending on the job that you're looking for, you can kind of tailor it to what you want. Um, and depending on your major too, you know, you're going to obviously change the ways that you are, place, places that you're working and uh, the type of work you're going to do. So thank you. That's all. Thanks a lot, Brent. So I've put the link to this in the chat for anybody who wants to uh, access it. But this is, uh, I'm also going to give a, a general disclaimer that this is my opinion of a quick guide to choosing a career in STEM. So I've made a dichotomous tree. And I'm kind of trying to make it so that um, it has all the things that I wish somebody would have asked me when I was a high school student choosing my path. Um, just general questions like yes or no, you know, one or the other that um, I think would be helpful to ask yourself as a, a student. So uh, the first question that I would ask is, do you like finding qualitative or quantitative solutions? So qualitative solutions are like biology where it's more like conceptual, you're memorizing a little bit more than you would be calculating. And then quantitative solutions would be like calculus or physics, you know, where you're solving a math problem and it's an equation and you want to get to uh, final answer using math. So um, you can feel free to ask yourself these questions as we go, but um, you don't have to like type it in the chat or anything unless you want to. Um, so the second question I would have liked to be asked or I think would be valuable is, do you like seeing the real world applications of your work or do you like solving abstract theoretical problems? So um, you can click the next one, I think. Uh, so theory would be more about um, like math and physics, pure, like pure math, where you're just kind of like theorizing and calculating a lot of, um, you know, doing proofs and stuff like that. Or there's also, um, or like that would be more academic academia route where you are like researching um, like kind of master's level later on or other other fields where you're more focused on like just hammering at equations and then the applications so we're going to go that way but yeah I should have mentioned for the previous one we're continuing down the quantitative path so quantitative applications and now we've got um, the next question. Do you like developing your own designs to problem or solutions to problems, or do you prefer a standardized approach? So for a standardized approach, um, that would be more like some examples that I thought of would be like accounting or actuarial science. Actuarial science is like insurance uh, math, basically. <laughs> so those types of things have a very like standard, standard procedure to arrive at your final answer. Um, and it's not like it really changes, like you have to calculate someone's taxes, like there's a way to do that. Um, and then analytical chemistry would be an example of like a science application of that. Um, what, if, you're, if you'd rather develop your own solutions and you can carry on down that path, um, which brings you to the next question, are you okay with office work or would you prefer to be in a shop or lab setting? Um, so I think uh, there are definitely jobs where you can do both, like Brent's, and I also had co-ops where where it was pretty great because you can you can really see the applications of your work. Um, but not all engineering jobs are like that. I actually I feel like they're a little more rare than people give them credit. Um, so I would say if you are in a position where you really like hands-on work and you could not envision yourself sitting in an office all day, then that might lead you to choose like an engineering technology or technician program. Like even technologists are, are actually in the office quite a bit. So more of like a, a college program where you would be doing like physical hands-on work. Uh, lab technicians would be kind of like the chemi chemistry application of that. Um, so if you don't mind doing office work and you don't mind, uh, yeah, like sitting at a desk for a little more of your day, then you can, Bring, that brings you to engineering. So love to have you here. Um, so the last question I have is what applications are you interested in? So this is really where it like branches out into all these different fields. Um, I am obviously not an expert in any of these, but uh, just to give you a general idea, and there's also so, so many more choices, but um, like 
coming out of high school, a lot of times you can go right into a general engineering program, or if you come to Conestoga, then we actually have four engineering programs, not these four. We have mechanical, electrical, power systems, and building systems um, to choose from, but uh, it just, I just didn't want anyone to feel like overwhelmed with the choices, but there are like so many different directions you can head with it, which I think is exciting. So for mechanical engineering, um, it's generally like things that move, uh, you're looking at things that can break, things that uh, are exchanging heat or can be affected by flow or be controlled. So some interesting physics projects could be like your Rube Goldberg project or your egg drop project and you know tech, tech courses like uh, machine shop and drafting. And then civil engineering, um, it covers things that absolutely should not move. <laughs> so like a bridge, you would not want that thing moving very much. Obviously there's like small vibrations and things like that that they designed to like wind obviously affects that. Um, but uh, yeah, generally you don't want your bridge moving very much. Uh, buildings and other structures that should stay still. Uh, and then things that can break, it's, it's similar to mechanical. There's quite a bit of overlap. It's just, you know, you don't want your thing moving. Uh, and then all, civil also focuses a bit like on construction on construction and buildings, as I mentioned. And then electrical, so things that you can't see. <laughs> so I, I like I think that's an important distinction to make because personally, for me, I would rather work on something and see see the product of my work. But with electrical, it's a little more challenging for me personally to wrap my head around like what's going on if I'm coding something. And it's not working it can be really frustrating uh and then same with like wiring you can't really see the current flowing through the wire so you can't see like oh that thing should be plugged into the relay and it isn't like it's just um a different troubleshooting process so things that can be programmed or things that can be sensed or actuated and then uh relevant courses include electronics physics computer science and then chemical the last like final distinction i'll make is the chemical Engineering is about processes, not about um, really performing. Like I, I've seen people who are really passionate about chemistry and then they choose chemical engineering uh, because they think they're gonna be kind of like doing the same thing that a chemist would do. And that's not really true. They're more focused on like optimizing a process to refine a, pro a raw material into a usable product. So for example, I had a co-op at Fortis BC and we worked with uh, renewable gas upgrading facilities. So we would take raw biomethane and then refine that and upgrade it to pipeline quality methane that could be injected one for one and used as natural gas. So I was the only, or me, myself and my supervisor were the only mechanical engineering students or engineers on the project, um, but there was a lot of chemical engineers. So that would be my, uh, my dichotomous tree to hopefully help you uh, figure out where you land in this in this wild world. Um, so yeah, links in the chat. And then also I wanted to mention that there is a poll um, that would be great if everyone can fill out. I, I know that um, we had some high school students come and uh, looks like they've had to go. So <laughs> that's unfortunate, but uh, the hopefully the rest of everyone can uh, do some poll, can answer the poll for us. And uh, so that's open. So uh, feel free to fill that out at your leisure. We also have some prizes. Um, so also to accommodate the high school students, uh, I we did have a wheel that we were gonna spin and like have everyone's names. Just know that I'm still gonna do that, but I'm gonna leave it open for later. So um, there's some questions here. If if everyone could write down these questions and then uh, and then have your answers emailed. So if you could answer all three of these questions and then email uh, VPI underscore CES. I'll put this also on the last slide. Um, so just make sure you have these questions written down. And then if everyone can email me their answer by five o'clock today, so that's six hours from now, but just do it as soon as you can. Um, then we, uh, I'll, pick, I'll pick six winners or randomly, just know I'm gonna spin the wheel and then uh, we'll have some prizes for them. So um, I'll give you guys like, 10 seconds to maybe screenshot it. You can press Windows print screen or you can press Windows button S shift and then that will screen stamp it and copy it to your clipboard um, to grab these questions. Um, if you have a hard time or like if you miss them or uh, if you need me to go back to them, just let me know in the chat. Um, so 
So I think we're good there for now. And then, yeah, you can go to the next slide there. Sweet, yeah, so hopefully we got um, a new future engineer. So we wanted to open it up for questions. We just threw our, um, like our past experiences up here to help everyone navigate. Uh, like if they had any particular questions, all four of us have actually done some sort of previous schooling before coming to engineering. So we wanted to, uh, you know, include that to maybe help you guys if you had any questions. There is a question in the chat, Brittany, and um, I can actually uh, answer this if you like. Uh, so when I entered engineering, I have a marketing, I have a, a marketing background. Uh, it's obviously very different from an engineering field, uh, but I did enjoy math and science classes when I was in high school. So I decided to go into engineering. I had to, actually had to teach myself grade 12 physics and calculus before getting accepted into my program. Um, when I started my program, I had no idea how to write software. I really didn't fully understand hardware design. Um, but I just made sure that I was applying myself at every step to make sure to like, kind of get brushed up on it and catch up with some of the other students in my class. Um, Arduinos, um, Arduinos and Raspberry Pis are great project boards to get into because uh, they can, first of all, there's tons of resources online for them. So even if you are like fairly new to it, you can pick some stuff up online and kind of just copy the projects that people have completed just to get familiar with it. And then they're so adaptive that, you know, you can have an idea for a project and chances are you can, you can more likely pull it off with a Arduino or Raspberry Pi. Uh, I'm using a Raspberry Pi for my current capstone project in fourth year. So they are extremely good tools. I think uh, it would be a good idea. Maybe if there's something you wanted to look into before entering the program, for sure, uh, great idea. Uh, soldering and like welding equipment, it's not very expensive, but honestly, it's not terribly difficult. I picked up soldering in probably like two days in first year um, and it's different for everyone, but the more practice you have with it, uh, the better you'll be with it, but you'll get tons of opportunities in first year, especially for the ESE program to uh, familiar yourself, familiar, familiarize yourself with those processes. And uh, props are always around and our lab tech's always around to help you out when you're having issues. Yeah, and just to add on to that, I always was really nervous um, that I that I'd be behind everyone. Like I remember coming to two or Conestoga um, before I started and I saw the first year students projects. I saw that um, the robot arm that Mitch showed. Um, and I remember being like, I have no idea how to make that. Like how am I gonna learn that in one year? Um, so I think I also learned about like, I could go into a tangent about confidence, but I think that, um, that you will learn the skills that you need by coming into the program. Like it's designed for people who don't necessarily have background in those subjects. So um, definitely don't be intimidated by the amount of information thrown at you or like skills that you'll learn. It's just, um, it's just a, a challenge. And I think if something isn't challenging you, then it's maybe not worth doing. Or maybe like, I just, I believe in always challenging yourself to be uh, the best that you can be. So uh, yeah, definitely don't be dissuaded by it by how crazy things look, because you'll learn it. And don't underestimate the power of YouTube and Khan Academy for building those foundations for some things. Uh, I will admit that there are times that I still rely on those to, uh, to remember something from high school or something like that. So uh, at all levels of education and professional development, I think YouTube and Khan Academy, at least for myself, will, will always be there. <laughs> 
definitely. <laughs> No worries. Um, if there are any other questions, we can flip to the last slide. Um, if you think of questions later on, you can reach out uh, to our engineering society on the Instagram there or Facebook. And then also you can email me at bpi underscore ces at conestogac.on.ca. There's lots of letters in there that shouldn't be there, but um, <laughs> free to send an email to me if you think of a question later that you want me to ask any of the presenters today or myself. Um, yeah, I really appreciate everyone coming out and hopefully you learned something valuable. Um, and then don't forget to fill out that uh, that prize. Email me with email me at that email address with those three questions. Um, we can put the screen or we should flip to the sponsor page. But if you didn't get the questions, uh, let me know. So yeah, thank you everyone for coming out today. And thank you to our sponsors. <laughs>